Willkommen. <laughs> um, it's uh, sehr gemütlich in here. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening uh, to the opening of the Burkhardt Library from Annemarie and Lucius Burkhardt. Uh, we're very honored uh, to have you all here this evening, as well as a number of people who I think have had many connections with the Burkhardts uh, in their own lives. Um, and we look forward to un unpacking that experience um, and that legacy uh, together over the coming months uh, around this library. Uh, tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dieter Rolstreiter and Adam Simsek, who uh, will be each saying a few words around the archive, um, and then we'll follow uh, that discussion with um, any questions uh, or conversations that you would also like to add. Um, so yes, without further ado, I hand the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Adam Simsek. I'm, I'm the artistic director of uh, Documenta 14, and this is a very um, um, touching moment for us because of the physical presence of this library here which we uh, actually found in a way in a in a container in the area of the university so there seems to have been some containers that were provided by a, paradoxically by a car manufacturer if I'm not mistaken for some temporary use for the university so the fact that Lutz's book art library ends up in car container temporarily while he was very much for pedestrianization uh, for many different reasons of, of the urban space is an interesting point from which to start the investigation and as we looked at this library without looking into the details we thought that the sheer volume of, um, of the books is worth uh, exploring further and therefore, uh, we formulated a very simple, uh, rather informal proposal to the university to actually start making use of this library. And this is why we are here tonight. And uh, Dieter Rostret, a curator of Documenta 14, will be talking about uh, a number of books that he selected for this occasion. And this is just the beginning, because the library has to be fully unpacked. Well, maybe not fully, but to a degree unpacked. And there will be different acts of this unpacking happening. And Dieter is the the first one, so I'm very curious to hear um, about his selection. Mine would have been, uh, I presume, different, right? On, we'll on, the, we'll uh, on the antagonistic note. Right, of course. Um, so, uh, f regarding why we uh, decided to look a little closer at um, into the the heritage, material and immaterial, here in this city of uh, Anna Mary and Lucius Burkhardt. The reasons are many. Um, the, the kind of uh, personal story is short. I did not have a chance to meet Lucius Burkhardt. I only saw him on, on the films and I heard from people who met him. He was an outstanding personality, it seems, and his writing is, is brilliant and still uh, not recognized enough, uh, it seems. So it's a small circulation uh, in which his, his writings uh, lately uh, appeared. There is some English translations and some, some German publications. But uh, I had a chance to meet Annemarie Burkhardt, and that was in, if I remember well, must have been 2004 in Kassel. So that was, a, I, I, as far as I remember, two years after Lucius Burkhardt's death or so. Um, so uh, this very uh, lively person arrived in one of the openings of uh, exhibitions at Kunsthalle, and she was uh, half critical and half uh, joking, and this was more or less how I remember her. She was, she was a very... Um, um, she was very acute in the way she formulated her judgments, but at the same time she had a certain sense of humor that kind of balanced out uh, this critique or cri criticality. And she was in particular uh, critical of architecture or rather of certain aspiration of architects to, to become the masters, of, the masters of cities. So there was a kind of impulse in her um, way of addressing the issues of architecture that was kind of going against architecture. Uh, in a way, or, or a certain ambition of architecture that has to do with, uh, let's say, splendor and possessiveness of this profession that seem to be inherent features of architecture lately, 
if you think about the phenomenon of star architects and the general um, neglect of the issues of uh, thinking about cities uh, in a larger way. So from uh, Anna-Marie Burkhardt, uh, I learned a few things, uh, not in a very syst systematic way, probably about the importance of addressing the, the issue of the cities we live in. And this prompted further reading, so the text of Lucius Burkhardt. And some years later, I, I decided to organize an exhibition at the Kunsthalle in which we posed a very deceptively simple question, namely, why is the landscape beautiful, which is uh, a title borrowed from, from one of the essays of Lucius Burkhardt. And uh, this title um, contains, I mean, it's a, as I said, de deceptively simple title because it, it also uh, contains a certain presupposition. So uh, it makes us focus on the issue of beauty of the landscape, but it kind of hides the the very core of the question, which, which is the landscape itself. And the landscape itself, I believe, was the, the core interest in Lucius uh, Burkhardt's writing. So he famously saw uh, the man-made landscape as the only thing that is accessible to us today. So a anything that we would see would be the landscape that is made by men and women. And this is quite, quite a terrifying re realization that this whole issue of idealized nature and you know all the sentiments that we may have versus uh, the phenomena of nature has to be seen through a filter of culture and actually perceived as a landscape and uh, you know broken down into into its constituent parts that come from art history you know from the structures of power and from many many other ends so um, I believe that uh, the position that the Burkharts took without really occupying it but shifting all the time is a very productive point of departure for several lines, lines of thought that we want to, and we are actually already, I must say, pursuing in, in this documenta. So um, I would only say that definitely we will be also featuring the, the work of Lucius Burkhardt in documenta 14 and next year. And by putting the work in parentheses, <laughs> Ed educational department. Um, by putting the notion of work in parentheses, uh, I'm trying to imitate the strategy of Lu Lucius Burkhardt, who seemed to, to basically question any received uh, notion of things such as education, things, as, uh, things such as uh, urban planning and architecture. So he would always take a little distance to the term and try to look at it carefully before he actually approach the, uh, the, before he would actually enter into practice, be it the practice of teaching or practice of, of let's say, urban intervention, um, trying to, on a micro scale, transform our perception of city, and let's say our perception of city, because his interventions seem to have an afterlife that is very, very much alive. Um, so we don't see the uh, practice of Lucius and Anna-Marie Burkhardt as something that is a closed chapter, but we see it very much as something that we can enter and maybe productively use also in strategies that we would like to deploy um, during Documenta, um, looking at the city of Kassel and trying to understand it. It might be very productive to gather the huge body of knowledge that Lucius Burkhardt produced while teaching here at the university since the early 70s, and also his methodology. And uh, in this methodology, that famously also includes the, you know, the terms such as uh, the science of walking, the pr promenadology, or strology, um, we think that there are interesting links to be made to other practices, be it uh, the work of artists who are going to be uh, part of, of the exhibition, but also work of certain architects. And here one example maybe worth noting is a Greek architect, uh, Dimitris Pikionis, um, who, who was someone uh, very important for uh, an early, uh, let's say, corrector or 
correcting of uh, the kind of all overness and international aspiration of modernism. So, in 1935, when the International Congress of Architecture, uh, of Modern Architecture, SIAM, was taking place uh, first on the ship cruising the Mediterranean between Marseille and Athens, and then through a series of conferences and side visits in Athens. Uh, interestingly, the, some of the Greek architects proposed that perhaps the local and vernacular traditions not understood as a kind of nostalgia or nationalistic sentiment, but as a building practice that is very worth considering, bearing in mind the, you know, the, 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 the culture of a place and also the very simple natural conditions of the place, that this has to be taken into account. So therefore, the, 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 the kind of pattern that, that the international modernism seemed to be spreading all over the world through its magazines, through its conferences, and not the least through its built environment, was challenged very early on. And uh, this through Dimitri Picionis, who later on in the 50s, and this is why I, I brought him now together with Lucius Burkhardt, uh, designed a very uh, interesting uh, monument in Athens, which is a, a series of uh, paths that are paved with stones, and these stones are both natural stones and they are like found elements of existing architectures, both modern and ancient and so forth. So the commission was that Picionis was supposed to, to design new, uh, <coughs> let's say, access routes to Acropolis, and instead of designing something relatively straightforward, for instance, a road or something similar, he decided to first uh, go through a series of uh, site visits and observations. So he basically tried to understand uh, the existing paths on the hills. So uh, these paths were made by shepherds and by people who were, for different reasons, climbing the hill. And along, this, uh, along some of these paths, he sort of traced his own, not adding anything new to the landscape that there was, but sort of elevating it or elaborating it through a gesture more of a sculptor than architect. So this is, to my knowledge, one of the very few built works of architecture that, that is de decisively flat and horizontal and very unassuming. And I think this is something that, that connects Picionis to Lucius Burkhardt. So this is just one <coughs> little story that I think will be great to uh, address once in more detail, perhaps with uh, a, a Greek or other specialist. Uh, Kenneth Frampton wrote a very beautiful uh, uh, book um, and uh, essays on, 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 on Picionis, and, and perhaps we will be able to host him here one day. Okay, uh, end of the detour, and now uh, I would like to uh, give the floor or the couch. Couch, uh, <coughs> canapé. Yeah. Over to Dieter. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, it's a uh, slightly larger crowd than we expected. I think. Can uh, Claire confirm that? Uh, oh, she's actually outside. The person who organized the event is outside. Um, so yes, a capacity crowd, which uh, you know probably is due to the fact that either people are starving for documenta news or they are starving to hear more about Lucius Burkhardt or maybe the space is just too small. Um, anyway, um, I will, uh, yes, welcome uh, everyone and, and thanks for coming in such um, nice numbers. And um, so what we're doing today is basically we are, well, the title of the event says Unpacking My Library, which is of course a reference to a famous essay that uh, Walter Benjamin wrote at some point in his um, nomadic life when basically he was forced to move from one city to the next uh, every couple of months so he was always unpacking his library and it was actually Claire who pointed out that the title of the event might uh, cause confusion because some people may have shown up thinking that we would be unpacking the library um, as in like actually doing it and putting it on the shelves so I'm you know I have to apologize to those people it's been unpacked already um, so it you know the uh, so what we'll do, um, so rather than unpack, we'll actually kind of curate a little bit with the library. And so um, what I thought would be the model for today's um, event, you know, I'm just going to go over to the shelves every now and then, pick out a couple of books and talk about those. Um, 
and I'll talk about those in a way that uh, um, that obviously honors uh, the Burkhardt legacy, but you know, mostly I'm using these books to shed some light on some of the curatorial research interests that we've been cultivating the last two years, and which you know kind of add um, or illustrate uh, in which way we have been using uh, Lucius and Anne Marie Burkhardt as guide as guides in a way to to mapping. Um, some of our research uh, uh, in the service of Documenta 14. Um, so I'll be going back and forth. And, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I thought these are actually two volumes that I thought um, Adam should probably take home. Because I know that after after Documenta 14, he's been expressing a desire to return to his old home of Basel, which is where he was first <laughs> exposed to the riches of the Burkhardt history. So these are Basel, die schöne Altstadt, and a, a, a trilingual guide to Basel. So um, I, I, as the librarian, I will later check these out for you. Um, but uh, so yes, because of course it all starts in Basel, where uh, Adam worked for 11 years, and that's also where he was first exposed to um, the, uh, the Burkhardt, um, the Burkhardt um, effect, the syndrome, the Burkhardt um, <laughs> syndrome. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's, let's start. Let's begin. <laughs> so, of course, <laughs> Um, the library is a bit is 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 uh, it'll it'll uh, probably show I hope in in the exhibition that'll open in Athens in 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 April in Kassel in June uh, but it will uh, hopefully show that the library as as an idea as a notion has been something of a, an iconographic interest that uh, that compels. Um, many of us. And, and so the idea also for the Burkhardt Library is that uh, once it is dismantled here in February, um, it will go underground for a couple of uh, months and then it will return during the exhibition as an actual, um, as an actual object and it won't be the only library to, um, to, to share in that fate. Another library that we are interested in exploring in greater detail here in Kassel is the Isaac Prager Library of Historical Judaica from the uh, uh, 19th century, which is now held in the Murhach uh, uh, Bibliothek, and that's you know another library that we're interested in, in featuring as an object almost or as a research tool. And there are artists participating in Documenta 14, people like Maria Eichhorn, for instance, who um, have also who are you know thinking along the lines of of libraries as as research tools. So in a way, curating uh, the Burkhardt Library or inaugurating the, the Burkhardt Library is also a way of opening up this kind of first um, pri like this first major uh, curatorial motif for Documenta 14. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, of course, we're all bibliophiles here. Um, you know, we love books, and I just only today actually um, came here, maybe, no, yesterday I think I, I arrived, I, 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 you know, immediately spotted the first titles that really kind of drew my attention. I spent an hour here today picking out some titles, uh, the titles of the books that I'll hold aloft um, during um, the course of the evening, and um, of course a lot of it has to do with just the beauty of a cover, and, you know, the beauty of, of or, or the feel of the material, and, and just kind of like a general, um, a general love of books, which I think is something that, uh, um, you know, binds many of us um, um, together and something that I'll return to in a little while. But I should actually, but I should say that the selection of books here has been completely serendipitous and accidental. It's like, you know, bumping or stumbling onto like a treasure and just kind of you know picking out what 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 works and what kind of triggers an argument or 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 a certain kind of logic and um and the first thing that i it, actually this is the first book i saw yesterday <laughs> heimat i mean i'm uh, i should i'm not german um i i do speak german and i have a very german sounding first name in fact, so German that nobody of my generation is called Dieter in Germany. Um, 
but of course, I mean, Heimat is a universal uh, is a universal concept, and and uh, I think one of the things that you know first kind of or that immediately drew me uh, to it was um, yeah, it comes along with this little other booklet that's called Heimat Heimat Schutz und Heimat Design, SVB document Schweizerische Werkbund, um, and there's there's no real order in the um, library as of yet. We are going to install an order, in fact. Um, and in that order, it will, you know, probably emerge that the notion of Heimat was uh, an important one for Burkhardt. Um, I mean, home, of course, in 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 English, if you wish. But, in, but you know, in German, the, the, the term has so much more meaning. And I think that... Um, we're kind of interested, actually, in this notion of of homelessness, obviously, and homeliness. Homelessness is a very important uh, concept um, for uh, Documenta 14, an exhibition that is taking place in Athens, which is the main thoroughfare in Europe for you know streams of millions, literally, of immigrants, uh, immigrants, you know, Flüchtlinge, um, looking for a new home, leaving an old home behind, looking for a new home behind. And so, you know, the, the notion of home and long and, and homecoming and, and longing for a home, nostalgia, you know, Heimweh, all of these notions are actually quite uh, interesting to us. And I think that one of the, what kind of also spoke to me in the selection of this particular title has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, I feel or I sense that Lucius Burkhardt was somebody who was interested in saving certain concepts from the monopolization of certain kind of, you know, reactionary political forces. He was, of course, a product of a very progressive culture in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, somebody who you know, very much belonged to the uh, to the the left the left wing of the political spectrum. And as such, I think it's quite um, paradigmatic that he would be interested <laughs> in in you know a critical analysis of a notion such as Heimat, in fact, and I think it's kind of um, exemplary for us, I think, you know, so that's why um, this was kind of the first book that struck me um, as, as, as useful in kind of thinking through some of the, you know, concerns that occupy us in Documenta 14. Um, yeah, so Heimat, you know. <clears throat> and then there was this other thing. Szenen der Volkskunst. Massive. Who knows this book? Really? Um, this was uh, it's a catalog of an exhibition at the Württembergische Kunstverein Stuttgart in 1981. So already in 1981, the Kunstverein in Stuttgart was world famous for uh, producing very uh, um, impressive tomes and theoretically sophisticated um, exhibitions. So, um, scenes of folk art, and um, I just leaf through this very fast, and you know I see that some of the titles here listed in the co in the table of contents say Zeitgenössische Kunst und Volkskunst, Traditionelle Volkskunst, Laienkultur, Subkultur, Alternative Kulturen, Massenkultur, and then finally Volkskunst in Africa, and. Um, <laughs> Very bizarre. I haven't really spent time with this book, but it looks incredibly compelling and engaging. And um, probably if you just kind of look through it, now it may look like the catalog of Documenta 14. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. But um, but I did like this book, I think, China chimes in, or the title of the book, and just what it suggests and insinuates, chimes in with another... Um, you know, substantial curatorial concern shared among a ever-expanding team of curators and curatorial assistants and assistant curators and curatorial advisors and colleagues, um, which is a um, an interest, I think, in, yeah, it's hard to call this from contemporary folk culture, but, you know, kind of the, 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 the bleeding edges and the porous borders between vernacular cultures, contemporary indigenous cultures, and you know, kind of the, 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 the broad continuum of elite culture versus mat, mass culture. So, you know, which in the 21st century, of course, means something very different um, from what it did in 1981, which is now 35 years ago. And, um, and I think, you know, this is, uh, um, I'm not sure how much I can, 
how many secrets I can give away about what Documenta 14 is going to look like. But surely one of the things that I think will set the exhibition apart from um, its precedence is a, uh, a much stronger presence <laughs> of what one could refer to as indigenous artists, artists, you know, kind of hailing from particular cultural contexts in the world um, where, you know, they have suffered a long history of marginalization, even though, you know, they are kind of like the allegedly first peoples of those regions. And, um, and I think that those, this notion of in, in indigenous, indigenousness um, helps to kind of complicate um, the picture of contemporary art in the 21st century, which is, of course, a highly uh, mediatized, um, highly mediatized event. And um, so, yeah, I think, uh, so Adam, you know this book, it seems? Yeah, I, that's, that's by, heart. by heart, really. I'll, I could tell. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so these, I think that, you know, Heimat, Heimat Schutz, Heimat Design, Volkskunst, I think that, you know, it's a really tricky tangle and a, and a complicated dance, um, which is, of course, why it's so attractive to us. So, yeah, these, these uh, so far, well, where are we? Yeah, this is really great. Tumult. <laughs> Who knows to move? It's a journal. I have one voice. And then, oh yeah, this is also really, I'll come back to this later, but uh, every single book in this library has a bookmark. And this one has a handmade, it's a handmade wishing, like a, like a Wunschkarten mit angels. Anyway, I don't really know what um, tumult is. Um, so mag it appears to be a magazine that you know used to be published twice a year, jeweils im Frühjahr und Herbst. It's published in Wetzlar. Ah, there you are. So it's a Zeitschrift für, für Verkehrswissenschaft. <laughs> it's a magazine for um, traffic science, um, which of course one would expect in uh, in Lucius Burkhardt's library. But this, strangely enough, is a uh, is the vote is like a themed issue around the concept of angels no i mean angle is angels right i don't i'm not mistaken yeah so so i don't know what angels have to do with traffic science <coughs> but um but it's really quite yeah i mean that i thought was really beautiful and uh, i believe that um oh there's like you know a michel foucault and a jörg becker jochen gertz so um i believe this also has uh uh, there's some some connection here with Ivan Illich. Uh, but I don't even know. Anyway, I've, uh, it's beautiful. Um, but this I, was the first thing I picked up because... Um, and now I'm going to go out on a limp. Maybe, I'm, maybe this is a personal fetish of mine um, <laughs> of late. And, and, you know, and Documenta shouldn't take responsibility for it. But... Uh, so it's close in the library. It was close to books about Kirchenbau von heute für morgen, <laughs> and um, and Kirchen in Not. Um, and then there's this really beautiful uh, book. It looks like a monograph about one particular concrete church, church uh, you know made in concrete. So obviously. Lucius was it was interested. Lucius and Amari were interested in um, ecclesiastical architecture, modern ecclesiastical architecture. So kind of you know, <coughs> the fate of church building in the secular era, which they inhabited um, so clearly. And then it uh, then there's this really amazing. Yeah. Anyone seen? Anyone knows this? Luther und die Folgen für die Kunst which, you know, is something that definitely we should keep close to our hearts because, of course, next year is not only the centennial of the Russian Revolution, which we'll come back to, but also the 500th uh, anniversary of the Reformation. So um, Luther will be a, uh, will be a major um, cultural presence in all of Germany next year in the Documenta 14 year. And uh, who knows, he might also actually kind of uh, haunt certain corners of Documenta 14. But um, I don't really know whether, uh, whether the Burkharts were religious at all. Um, does anyone know? Yeah. They were? They were. They were. Well, Swiss, Swiss Protestant Church. 
Swiss Protestant Church. I belong to the Borkert family yes. uh, from Basel. Uh, you know it, and some, are, some, some of the others as well know it. Uh, we're actually uh, uh, in close connection to the big uh, families in Basel yes. uh, that were all very Protestant and part of the Protestant culture of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Luther was a bit critical about all of that mm -hmm. as well. So uh, he read that and uh, never read it, just he said something about it, uh, like, uh, well, uh, he reflected the whole basis of Switzerland and uh, the Protestant culture of Switzerland, which makes it famous for all the money and all those things. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's the history of that, and that makes yeah. it interesting for him. But I didn't find a book that says Calvin or Zwingli und die Folgen für die Kunst. <laughs> so, you know, clearly an apostate. Um, Thanks for the uh, brief clarification, Helmut Holzapfel, who was instrumental, I should say, uh, uh, a former associate of, of Lucius and Anna Marie, who was instrumental in bringing the library from the uh, um, the basement of its uh, of its home and university to um, Peppermint. So thank you for that. In any case, Kevin uh, Boy for von heute für morgen question mark. You know, just these are beautiful things that. Uh, um, Again, perhaps, you know, they, they, they tie in with this interesting in folk art and, you know, the notion of Heimat and, like, you know, the, the spiritual in art and, or, you know, religious experience in art, which are things that are not really that um, well regarded in contemporary um, art culture, I should say. So it's interesting to see that these books would appear on their shelves. And, and obviously this is a working library. It was part of... Uh, it was an academic toolbox. I don't know what the private library at home looked like and how many Bibles there were, or Korans, or, or Zohars, or Talmuds, or Torahs. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's that's that. Um, okay, let's look for some more books, right? Yes. So traffic, right? <clears throat> I'm not gonna dwell. Uh, on these too long because everybody here, well, yeah, like people, I, I assume that nobody came to hear me talk, but everybody came to uh, to see Lucius's books come to life. And so books that are titled The Pedestrian in the City or The Man in the Street really shouldn't be discussed much more because they are, you know, they're the very heart. They constitute the very heart of, of, uh, of Lucius's uh, and Anna Marie's uh, conceptual concerns. Um, but I just like the titles, The Man in the Street and The Pedestrian in the City. And, um, and I'm sure that, you know, once upon a time, these books were probably also organized in a way that would allow you to read them as a poem almost. Um, I mean, it's certainly something that I try to do when I organize my library. I just kind of make sure that, the, that, you know, that titles follow each other as if you can read them. So The Man in the Street, The Pedestrian in the City, The Pedestrian in the Street and The Man in the City. Um, <clears throat> But again, really, um, yeah, beautiful objects, and um, and um, hmm. yeah. Oh, and yeah, here's another one, really beautiful. Jean-Pierre Juncker, Alter als Exil. Zur gesellschaftliche Ausgrenzung des alten Menschen. I mean, that's forbidding. Um, but it's also, I mean, it's a beautiful title, it's a beautiful book, it's small, so, I don't know, is it made for le readers who get distracted quite fast? <laughs> or with short memories? Anyway, um, so what is it? Age as Exile. Um, I picked this one up because, um, well, in the first instance, perhaps, because you will find that there are m many artists of, of advanced age in Documenta 14. But maybe that's always the case, I don't know. Um, but, um, well, that's one thing. So age, but, uh, but you know, and ageism, and, and you know, what, what um, you know, the entanglement of the culture of contemporary art and, and you know, kind of this, this, this the, the cult of youthfulness, which of course we don't like and, you know, and I think that many of us prefer to hang out with uh, artists in their 80s and 90s. You know, those are often the most 
enlightening experiences. But uh, but the more important part, or the more important concept here is this notion of exile and exile. You know, the refugee, again, uh, flight, uh, the outcast, the outlaw, um, marginalization, you know, the nomad, all of these, uh, there's many more synonyms I could think of if I had my Deleuze somewhere around here. Um, but um, this I can also uh, promise with a great deal of certainty. This you will find that in the exhibition, again in Documenta 14 in Athens and Kassel, will be a recurring uh, motif. Um, I mean, not the not just kind of the real experience of of of, uh, of flight and escape and and homelessness and mobility as as you know quintessential conditions of of the contemporary and the modern, but also you know kind of the 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 old image of the artist as outcast or the the cultural producer as a, as a, as outlaw, which you know is something that I guess we are drawn to, you know, not the insider but the outsider, and perhaps this kind of ties back a little bit to this you know old notion of Volkskunst, which of course you know a couple of years ago was reinvented as outsider art, which is not you know anything we're interested in and celebrating, but still so. But it's yet another beautiful object, and um, and yeah, I don't know how many people here. Obviously, everybody is interested in books, and I don't know how many people read books on screens, you know, iPads or Kindles or phones. But uh, um, yeah, I don't think we do. No, not really. Um, we like the analog and. Uh, and I think we like the idea. I mean, of course, we have to, as curators, we'll have to figure out what life this object is going to lead in an exhibition where you have, like, thousands of people streaming into a building every day and looking at these things. So we have to kind of, you know, think a little bit about how to protect this thing without fetishizing it. But, you know, for sure, one of the great pleasures of bibliophilia or of the love of books is kind of just holding them and and, and touching them, which gives such a nice literal sense to the notion of the digital you know like digital culture doesn't have anything to do with you know uh, with the web and the net and uh, all that but it has to do with the use of your digits you know your hands so i think that's a digital culture that perhaps we're a little more interested in than you know the uh than than the religion of steve jobs so a beautiful book what else a little hot, no? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to get a little personal now, if you don't mind. Jan Hoot. My great compatriot, the former mayor of Kassel. <laughs> oh, this is a. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, this uh, this one. I, um, um, York Immendorf, um, little. I'll come back to that later. But anyway, um, this is a, <laughs> an interesting book because it shows the making of a show, and. Uh, and it has many pictures, many photographs of, uh, you know, people that I have worked with myself, actually, in the past and who have been important for my own curatorial development. But it looks so heroic, you know, they sit around with their stubble and they're actually mostly men, I have to say, overwhelmingly so. Um, Jan worked with a curatorial team of three cur co-curators, they were all men. One of them was Greek, Denis Zaharopoulos, he's been important for us in Athens for sure. Um, but you know, Mario Metz. So anyway, beautiful. This is a beautiful record of an art world that almost seems. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to miss it, but it certainly seems very remote, you know. And this is only the early '90s, so it's 25 years ago. Um, but already ancient and already kind of. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, yes, I mean, of course, this was quite interesting for me moving to Kassel <clears throat> because this is where I live as a Belgian working for Documenta, to always hear about Jan Hoot. Oh yes, Jan this, Jan that. He lived in the, he lived in the tower, 
and you know he drove he, he knew every taxi driver by name and so anyway he of course i didn't see his documentary in 92 i was too young to actually see it I was 20 and i was not interested in art at the time because my father was an artist and this was part of like you know the freudian uh, drive you know kind of patricide um but of course you know like many in many ways i think that working on documenta um, you always stand in the shadow of what came before, in the shadow of Carolyn's documenta is a big one, we'll talk about it in a little while. Um, the shadow of Roger Burgel and Urs Nowak's documenta, Giant, um, Okwi, um, Katrin David, and then of course there's Jan Hoots. And I think that you know Jan Hoots as the, as the inventor in a way of contemporary art, as part of the event, event culture, is somebody that you always have to kind of negotiate with. But I think that in the critical literature, literature he has uh, had a little bit too much of a bad rap. Though I also know that Anna Maria and Lucius had kind of beef with the, with the Jan Hood documenta, but we're not going to talk about that. But he, I mean, the nice thing is that Jan actually, he was the person uh, who kind of gave me my start in contemporary art. He invited me to work on an exhibition in Arnhem <clears throat> in 2001, sounds big. Um, which is very um, Sonsbeek, which was an exhibition that back in the 60s, 70s was almost as prestigious and important as uh, as as Documenta. And in Sonsbeek 71, a very... Um, in 1971, a big Sonsbeek exhibition was organized that also featured the work of Robert Smithson. And this is a really rare copy, a really rare um, catalog, which I just might take home later. Um, <laughs> I mean, we all we don't. It's not we're not only among bibliophiles here. There are also booksellers, or at least one that I know of. And we'll I'll ask him about this book later. Yeah. Um, yes, more beautiful books. <clears throat> so this, I first thought that this was a guide to Essen, but it's actually a book about eating. <laughs> um, but again, really beautifully designed. I mean, it's all Futura, you know? Like, uh, back then, it looked like only one font really existed. Um, Futura, you know, which, of course, design culture always being so hopeful about the promise of the future. But uh, Essen in that Arbeitsfeld, I think, was really quite beautiful. And I, I today, it was particularly important or particularly relevant because I, throughout the day, I was involved in a couple of conversations with some of my colleagues about the possibility of installing a catering business in one of our <coughs> exhibition venues. And um, actually at the Alte Neue Post, um, there's a beautiful can canteen there that will probably be brought to life partly as, a, uh, as, a, as an opportunity to eat and drink because it's something that I, saw, that I often feel in contemporary art or in art in general is not really kind of taken very seriously. The, the fact that visitors and viewers have bodies that go hungry and, and, and get tired. So I'm always, you know, whenever I still do curatorial seminars or curatorial classes or whatever, one of the first things I always tell aspiring curators is like start with thinking about the benches in your show because people want to sit down, you know, like you can't expect everybody to always live on their feet. And the same thing in a way is true of the, um, of what they call this really beautiful um, expression in um, Dutch, the inner mens. And I'm not sure if that translates uh, to, um, to German, that inner mensch. Does anyone know what that means? <laughs> that inner mensch had immer hunger. No? <laughs> or the, or the next. <laughs> Like, you know, you like Erstas Fressen, Money Moral, all these things. But um, so, you know, and this is something, uh, again, Documenta 14 is a, is a project that um, from early on has been animated by a deep preoccupation with notions of embodiment. You know, the, the body is not just a vessel for making art or a canvas. Or a, you know, or a screen to project on, but also like the body is as a kind of a political state of being, and um, and this is why I think it's very important to think about sitting, and eating and, and drinking. And so Essen in that Arbeitsfeld seemed like a very important book for us. And <laughs> tomorrow I'll I will read from it at the curatorial meeting that we're planning. Mm -hmm. And um, another important associate of the Burkhardt in the uh, in the city of Kassel is um, a gentleman called Martin Schmitz. I'm not sure if he's here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, there he is. Well, I'd say, you know, I, as I was speaking about Essen in der Arbeitswelt, I bumped across, I, I came across this really beautiful book called Currywurst mit Fritten. <laughs> Von der Kultur der Imbissbude, which is also an absolutely beautiful book. Um, I know, the, the, uh, your diploma Arbeit. Yeah. Oh. Yes. So great. <laughs> yeah. I miss the Imbissbudes of Kassel. <laughs> anyway, it's a really beautiful book, um, which, you know, again, it's difficult to make good art about food, but uh, maybe it's, or it's difficult to make good art, good, good exhibitions about food, but maybe you can make good art about food. So. Okay, let's conclude, no, because uh, I'm, I'm actually thirsty. In fact, could I have a drink? <laughs> no, no, I would like to have a, uh, no, the blue mic. <laughs> because I, I don't usually drink while I work, but I do work when I drink. So... Okay, so um, I think we're almost there. And then there's questions, geez. Um, yeah, these are Josef Rickford and Michael Müller. Ornament is kein Verbrechen. <laughs> uh, Architektur als Kunst. And then, die Verdrängung des Ornaments zum Verhältnis von Architektur und Lebenspraxis. So bizarre, no? Kind of uh, two, uh, like you know, the the paradox of the library again, um, which um, obviously a nod to Adolf Loos' timeless nineteen uh, twenties um, classic "Ornament und Verbrechen." Um, ornament is kein Verbrechen, and here the oppression of the ornament on the relationship of. Uh, architecture to the practice of everyday life. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so pleasant. Um, yeah, I don't have very much to say about these other than I think that we side with this. I think we all agree that ornament is kein verbrechen. And actually Adam said something quite interesting about uh, um, uh, Lucius, uh, the Burkhardt critique of, of architecture early on, which uh, I think pivots a little bit around this notion or around the difference between architectures, architecture and building, you know, the, the culture. Um, and I sometimes kind of say to myself that I don't care about architecture, but I do like a good building. It's like, you know, not caring about fashion, but do, you know, but enjoying a nice suit. And, um, and um, anyway, of course, I, I think that this book has to do with this long history of modernism as an insistence on the purification of everything that's external to function and, 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 and purpose. And, and of course, we all know that this, that this mission, that this drive to purify the architectural has failed miserably because people just like um, ornament and like trinket. And um, this is a really great pillow, I think, and also like the embroidery on the sp on, on on the sofa, um, speaks to a, a desire for ornament and ornamentation and the beautification of everyday life as a completely basic human impulse, and uh, and I don't know, I I'm kind of a, I'm um, seduced to say that there is no shame to think of art as part of this drive towards the beautification of life. I, um, this is not an original stance in the context of documenta. I think that Roger Bruegel uh, um, took a stand in this regard in uh, uh, in the run up to his exhibition. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, beauty has had this has has yeah. Anyway, I think it's something that we'll think about, or not. Uh, um, and then yeah, I well I brought up Bruegel just now and. This is a beautiful Surkamp Verlag edition of Paul Feierabend Wissenschaft als Kunst. I don't think we're going to do that. I don't think Documenta 14 will be Wissenschaft als Kunst. 
Well, maybe I'm mistaken. I don't know. Mm. Depends. I have to talk to my colleagues about that. But, <laughs> but I feel like this would be the book, of course, that Carolyn Crystal Vakargev would have shown you if she had been here, which I wish was the case. Um, because, of course, Documenta 13, to me, if I now, you know, in retrospect, it's uh, four years ago, actually, almost. No, it's more than four years ago. Whoa. Um, you know, in retrospect, if I think about um, Wissenschaft als, or if I think about Documenta 13 and I think about the, the, the science <coughs> art complex, which is, you know, perhaps, which may not figure that prominently in what we're going to do. Oh, right, I wanted to actually, sorry, there was one thing. Let me go, go back to, um, to Jan Hoot. Um, because it has this beautiful postcard, again. <coughs> and I'm trying to read it. I see that it's Herr und Frau Prof. Lucius Burkhardt, Emilienstrasse 16, Kassel, and then it says, Herzlich Dank für die Coins von James. Mit bestes einer, probably, um, it's probably a, uh, it's probably a, a postcard from Jan sent to the Burkharts, and uh, it has him on like a treadmill of sorts. And then if you look around, the title of it says Jan Hoot's Action in the World, 1990. It's totally beautiful. And in fact, I think perhaps there is an exhibition here for somebody who is interested in it. You know, like a, an exhibition of bookmarks and, and, uh, and, 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 Lesezeichnen, uh, found in the library of Lucius Burkhardt. But this one's really great. Um, and I'll conclude with um, another real beauty. Anatoly Lunacharsky. Die Revolution und die Kunst. I mean, of course, there's tons and tons of those in uh, in the library. It was strange, actually. I was surprised not to find any marks proper. Um, there's like Etienne Balibar, Lire le Capital. There's a lot of like kind of Marxist, um, you know, urban theory and, and Marxist inspired um, sociology, but uh, relatively few true Marxist classics. And this one um, stood out as one of them. And it uh, has this beautiful picture on the cover of Mayakovsky, Shostakovich, and I'm not sure who the third fellow is maybe I no Meyerhold I think anyway Lunacharsky was the first uh, um, commissar for the people's education um, appointed by Lenin in 1918 um, and so in 2018 we will celebrate the centennial of his appointment um, and I yeah so the revolution in the Kunst I think that it's um, Yeah, I think that kind of sums it up, I think, for the library. <laughs> so, I think that's, I'm done, for now. <laughs> There's many more books. But, um, I, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to do now. Is, are peop do people want to ask questions? <laughs> or if people just need some air and to move around and to have a more informal discussion, that's also very welcome. Uh, we have more glue vine in the back and <laughs> doors which can be opened for some air. <laughs> so, um, very good. Should we perhaps wrap up there then? And yeah, we should um, uh, continue. And we should also say, Claire, that this is so, this is, as, as Alan pointed out, it's the first chapter of a series of four of these events mm -hmm. in which we will unpack the library. There's another event planned in December, On January, the December 7th, January, and then February. And so um, each of those events will have a slightly different feel. Um, but yeah, we, I hope this has, yeah, I mean, I hope that this has been useful and, and enjoyable. And I would encourage people to drink blue wine <laughs> and ask me questions if so needed. Thank you.